The mood here is certainly more optimistic, and there are increasing signs that the crisis is nearing its end. Nevertheless, the dust to dawn curfew and the official state of emergency are still in force. It was never clear in my mind that the Black Power Boys wanted to seize political power. I think they saw themselves essentially as a pressure group. And they were hoping that the kinds of issues they were raising would be taken on by the government. And they would begin to resolve these problems of discrimination, you know, in the banks and in the businesses and so on. Which Williams eventually did, by the way. But I don't think they ever saw themselves seizing political power. Um, they certainly would not have had the support in the country as a whole. I don't think people were interested in that. Now, just because I represent my people who really didn't come out for war, you know, I got caught up in this struggle. I will have to go to jail or even die for. We were given our assignments, and mine was to turn this island into a political prison. And I held that position on Nelson Island for nearly six months. But then we all have to go one way or the other. We didn't come here to live forever because they take away my people's liberties and they made certain laws. On Nelson Island, sometimes things got a little tense. You know, we had to really manage human relationships there. And people had worries because, you know, they say that when you're in prison, they give you, they put sulfur in the food. It's just the lighter side of detention now. You know, they put sulfur in the food to kill your sex drive. So people used to be very worried about what they were, <laughs> about what they were being fed and wanted to know if everything would be in working order at the end of all of this. <laughs> there was a lot of worries about that, you know. So, so it, it wasn't only political, um, wasn't only political concerns. There were other concerns as well. There was no real problem of intimidation and brutality and that in this island. I want to be very frank and fair. But I would say this, you know, that I would rather stay in Nelson Island 200 times more than I would stay in the Royal Jail. The Royal Jail is hell, absolute hell. But you could put me where they held those detainees because I would die for a holy cause. I'll go to jail to balance the scale that justice should prevail. We are not for sale. I am willing to die for my brother man in the fight for the black man's liberation. When you come into the prison, the first thing you go is into, um, when you're charged as a prisoner, you come in and you have to go into a room for measurement. That is to get your, your prison uniform. And you have to take off all your clothes and stand up there in front of all the officers and whoever and the other prisoners, you're all there lined up naked and people are making comments about your bottom and your private parts and, and all these sort of things that are taking place there. In Royal Jail at the time, also the, the soldiers were there, Rafik and all, uh, Bazi and, and these other guys. And uh, it, it had a big influence on, on what the prison officers could have done or not done because they were they were mutineers, they were political detainees, they were on trial. Um, a number of the top detainees like uh, Macandal Daga, George Weeks, even Clive, a number of them were in the royal jail itself. So you had a hotbed of political and social turmoil within that organized prison system. So that um, by the time I had arrived there, it had already had an upbeat in terms of how even the prisoners were breaking all the rules and they were depending on the imprisoned soldiers and it was a lot and there was a lot of beating a lot of beating of prisoners who were breaking up the regulations because what they would do is that they would isolate them in the night when they close the cells and come in the cells and break uh, <coughs> cut uh, really i mean really brutalize the prisoners because the prisoners were prisoners but we were detainees so they couldn't hit us because, you know, other than that, outside two people used to be threatening them prison officers. If you hit so and so, remember, you had to go to work, you know where you're living and all them kind of things. So they were also constrained by that reality. So I think that the, the prison was not just a prison. It was a microcosm of all the rebellion and the, and, the, and, the, and the confusion that was taking place in the society at the time. When you see visitors' time came, and all these soldiers' family came, and all the activists' family came, 
and you were inside this place for visitors and things and so on. And then they started regulating it six by six. So they, they, when all these women came there, they used to be getting on in the prison. And you hear everybody shouting, power, and all the prisoners shouting, power to the people, power, and the whole prison shaking with this noise. And then visiting one of the detainees, there were little groups who would come out for visits between the bars, and um, he came out with this person, and so I was introduced. So we actually shook hands or fingers through the bars, because <laughs> they were little, just little wiring scoops, and this is how I met McCandle. This is not really known. <laughs> it was really something when those women came to, those, to that prison and they used to have the place shaking down, you know. Subsequently, they did the mutiny trials and Williams didn't believe that anybody in Trinidad could be objective about the events, so he brought in a, a, a group of Commonwealth military officers from the Commonwealth, including one Colonel Theophilus Dan Juma, who in the middle of the mutiny trials was recalled home to a mutiny in his own country. It was that the attitude of the government was, you want black power? You're talking about black power? Well, take black people, we're going to bring them from Africa to try you. That is what it was. That's why they couldn't bring the English or, or the Americans or what have you. you know, they wanted to bring the black people. You talk about black power, take black power. That was what it was. The mutiny trials were scandal. Uh, you know, they were very badly organized. The, the judges, they were army officers that they imported, they had imported from uh, Africa and Singapore and other places. Uh, they were, and the judge advocate was also from Ghana. From Ghana. And uh, they committed some, some abominations of, of, of law and of uh, criminal procedure in the mutiny trials. From the first day, it was very apparent. They didn't understand us, and we didn't understand them, right? So it was a big charade going on. We went one Saturday. We were invited, all the lawyers, to come down to visit the scene at, at Tetron. And it was very casual and so on. All the prisoners were there and, and so. Um, very strange thing to me because, you know, military life is a different life from civilian life. Eh? They, there were the three accused, LaSalle, Shah, and Bazi mixing with the officers who were trying them, you know, right? After we saw the scene, they had a drink, they had, we had beer and what have you and so on. And, and I was standing outside, you know, looking towards the sea. When this man came up to me, he was one of the judges. Um, his name was um, Colonel Achampong. He came from Ghana. And he said to me, uh, Mr. Dilima, my friend, you are a very interesting man. So I looked at him and I said, why do you say that, Colonel? He said, because you are taking everything in this, thing, in this trial for a joke. Everything is a joke for you. You make jokes of everything. So I looked at him and I said to him, well, Colonel, it is a joke, isn't it? And he says to me, ah, you are right. But you know, in my country, we would have shot them dead already. He says, in Trinidad, you make a joke of these things. But in where I come from, when you make an attempt to overthrow, you either succeed or you are dead. The mutiny trials turned on the issue of, of condemnation, that the, the army head then, Colonel Surratt, uh, he was said to have condoned the mutiny and as if we were forgiven them. And caused them to put their arms down and to get back in the ranks. And when they thought they were going through that process, he had them arrested and tried for, for mutiny. You know, so that, yes, they did commit mutiny. I, I don't think they could they, they deny that. Uh, they said yes, and they, look, they looked at the, all the reasons that were built up, built up inside of there that, like as in the rest of society, finally boiled over. But that Tourette had condoned their mutiny and they had trusted him, and he had betrayed their trust. Well, when the African judges heard that, well, I don't have to tell you, they don't know about this condemnation business at all. They, you know, and, and, and they, they, they put pay to that in no time at all. It's no, no, nonsense, man, you know. And, and they, they went about trying the question of the matter of condemnation in an irregular fashion.
That is what happened. And they gave all kinds of advantages to the prosecution that they, they couldn't have given. And then it was reviewed by a very professional and dispassionate uh, appeal court. Three very famous jurists who paid for it with their careers afterwards, heroically uh, courageous judgments based on the law, and they threw, they threw it out. You know, they, they threw it out. It was received as a kind of a victory for good sense, for good order, and uh, indeed for the rule of law. He, the government, paid for one year to put up this uh, uh, court martial. Uh, you know, the court, the Commonwealth, all these judges from the Commonwealth to put them up at the Hilton so that these men who were trying to kill him would get a fair trial. And I would submit to you respectfully that they got more than a fair trial. I remember it's interesting that Geddes Granger making a court appearance one morning. His skin had turned ashen, you know, from confinement. He looked almost white, actually. And there was a crowd outside the court. And when Granger came out the back of the Black Marie, you know, he shot his fist in the air and shouted, Black Power! And the crowd just looked. They just looked on. And I realized at that moment that he had lost the crowds. They, they realized that William is a more powerful figure. And fickle as crowds can be, at that moment, I realized, that's it. Granger can't pull that crowd anymore. And when he was subsequently released, he held a few meetings, but the crowds were very small, very unenthusiastic. It was a power play, and Williams proved himself to be the more powerful person. So that was the end of that. Democracy means recognition of the rights of others. Democracy means the equality of all in the eyes of the law. Doctor, is you who have power. I know when you act, it would have been a horse of a different color. Democracy means equality of opportunity for all in education, in the public service, and in private employment. I repeat, and in private employment. You give them an inch, they take a whole yard. Democracy means freedom of expression and assembly and organization. And when you hand them under your clinch, people say you're bad. All that is democracy. All that is our democracy. But when I heard you address the nation, I knew what was your intention. But some of the powers you exercise, unfortunately, I must criticize. We didn't want them trigger happy police. We only wanted to demonstrate in peace. Yet my people was held and charged for sedition. We was marching for equality, black unity, and black dignity. Dr. William, no, we didn't want no revolution. Despite not taking power, however, some things were achieved. There were a lot of concessions to the black power movement and what it stood for. There were definite efforts to wipe out the vestiges of, um, of open racial discrimination in the society, you had efforts on that. The institutions themselves that refused to hire people based on the color of their skins were actually making an effort to hire people based on the color of their skins. Now, to correct that obvious imbalance. The banks in Canada started actively recruiting Caribbean people. They went out to the campuses and started recruiting uh, Trinidadians, Jamaicans, and so on. And I remember a funny situation in Windsor. I had a friend, Trinidadian friend, French Creole, who told me he went for an interview and the bank said, we're not looking for people that look like you. <laughs> Every time I go into a bank in Trinidad, right, I look at those little black girls there, you know, well-dressed and so on, and going about their business. And I say in my mind, I want them to know that I am part of the reason why they're able to work in a bank. You know, because they couldn't. They couldn't work in a bank pre-1970. I used to be at the Queen's Park Cricket Club re regularly. And it was the first time in my life I knew they had so many white black people in Trinidad. Nearly every member of the Queen's Park Cricket Club was trying to convince me that they had African blood in them. The 
Enjak, Green Jack, ram the fear of God into them, we would be sitting down there bad, and they would all try to tell me, convince me, one, that they're not prejudiced, two, that some great grandmother or grandfather, them one had black blood. I used to, I mean, off the, I used to, I used to, I never know they have so many white niggas in Trinidad. <laughs> when the upheavals of 1970 and 1969-70 broke, and the things were rigidly divided between black and white. Even people who I was close to, people who were in, in the NJAC movement, they themselves couldn't easily continue their friendship with me in the way that it was before. Understandably, because they had a large following that saw things in that, in that, in that way. So that's why I say that uh, 1969, you begin to realize that in some ways, you, you have the, the um, emotional and, and psychological trauma of being not sure where you are, of, of searching for your roots to find what are the things that could anchor you in this place. You know, a lot of people left Trinidad after. Some say we can't stay here. Some say, well, they ain't moving. Some, a lot of people migrated, some who won. All the, the whole sections of the nation, I'm not talking about everybody, sought to see if they could go out. And I have no regrets, okay? I still love my Trinidad. <laughs> I still love Trinidadians. They're the best people in the world. <laughs> and thank God they have some of them living in Florida. Otherwise, I may have gone back a long time ago. <laughs> After 1970, there was everything changed. Behavioral patterns changed. Respect for the law. All those sorts of things changed. Because People could see that you could break the law and get away with it. You, know, you, could, you could actually walk, walk free from it. And that is what changed Trinidad. But Trini has a very funny way of forgetting. Their history to them, like it, don't mean nothing. Revolution means change, fundamental change in a people's life that can bring about a new way of looking at life and humanity that can be the interest of humanity. That's revolution. The history that went down in the 1970s, as though it never was today in this century. I know what I know. I was there. And I have a perspective that no one else has. No one else living. The only other person is Eric Williams, and he's well dead, thank God. But don't care how they try to tarnish these historic memories, I will always remember the roaring 70s. Tell them to write down this one here in the pages of history, 21st of April in the year of our Lord, 1970. When you pass in, give a hearing to this meeting. The time has reached when we should talk openly and tell them what we want is black dignity. Power is restored and black power. We want action now. Power is restored and black power. We're not going to bow. Power is restored and black power. They could bring their gun. Power is restored and black power. Black power. We had the courage of our convictions, and that is what youth is all about, having the courage of your convictions and following your heart, following your mind, following what of your heart and your mind tells you is just and is true and is right. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. It's important. Be observant. Remember all the things they have promised you. But when they got in power, what did they do? Power. Power. Tell them Granger say Power is restored and black power We ain't come to play Power is restored and black power They making we hop Power is restored and black power And it's got to stop At a particular point, the youth of this society has got to be able to stand up brave and bold and say, this is our country, 
we got to save the country. Take to Bago, as we all know, lovely water flows all over. The native not allowed to bathe, Pigeon Point. He will be locked up if he enters the joint. Power is the slogan, black power. This is our land. Power is the slogan, black power. They must understand. Power is the slogan, black power. Foreigners may come. Power is the slogan, black power. We demand freedom. It educated us. Not just about being African, but about you as a human being and your rights to justice and for your place in society. Demonstration through the nation is the motto we must follow. Our dignity, of course, we have to defend. And if we have the cause, we'll fight to the end. Power is the slogan, black power. We on the right track. Power is the slogan, black power. There's no turning back. Power is the slogan, black power. We will fight them all. Power is the slogan, black power. Till the last man fall. Same tea was very romantic. You break a glass, you enjoy yourself, back a line on your dog, you come back next day to talk about it, you check the curfew, you break the curfew, you ask what car come up, you run home. It was very, very romantic. 